Hello, everyone. Glad you could join us today. Um, for those of you who just joined, we are going to, we are already actually recording the session. So if you um, don't want to be a part of that, please do um, turn off your cameras. Um, welcome then to our second Zoom seminar devoted to underwater seascapes and imaginaries. We have quite an exciting lineup for you, so let's get started. We will be hearing um, from Dr. Helen Scales. Um, I'm going to um, introduce her in just a moment. Uh, we are also, um, so Helen, Helen, uh, Dr. Helen Scales is joining us um, from the UK. Um, she's a marine biologist. Mm -hmm. She's going to give her talk and then we're going to pause um, just for a question or two. And then my colleague, Anne-Laure Fortin-Tornez will introduce the underwater uh, sculptor, Jason Harris taylor who is also joining us. Um, we will again uh, listen to his presentation, uh, give the opportunity for you to ask um, just brief questions oriented directly to him. And then my colleague, Kamala Mamadna Zabrakova will introduce our third guest who is joining us um, from the US for our evening, his morning, um, hello there. He is uh, the digital platform director for Artworks for Change. We will again um, pause briefly for you to ask them, uh, ask him any specific questions then um, the, the team, the three of us, is going to open up a round, round table discussion with our three guests for just a little bit before opening the discussion to you. So as you did last time, um, feel free to engage in the chat um, during the entire session with your comments or your suggestions or your questions. And then at the end during the Q&A, um, Kamala will um, give you the opportunity to either ask the question yourself, turn on your camera and ask it yourself, or she will read it out for you. Or you can also use the raise hand function, or you may um, also just write in the chat, um, I have a question I would like to ask. Okay, okay. Well, without any um, further ado, then I will introduce Dr. Scales to us. Um, if uh, Dr. Scales, you want to turn on your camera so we can meet you. Okay, so Dr. Helen Scales is a marine biologist, a writer, and a broadcaster. She's the author of the Guardian bestseller, Spirals in Time, New Scientist Book of the Year, Eye of the Shoal, and the children's book, The Great Barrier Reef. She writes for National Geographic Magazine, The Guardian, and New Scientist, among others. She teaches at Cambridge University and is science advisor for the marine conservation and charity Sea Changers. Helen divides her time between Cambridge, England and the wild Atlantic coast of France. Dr. Scales naturally and immediately attracted our attention for this project um, due to her engagement with um, various artistic mediums. So combining scientific rigor with storytelling and visual creations, enchanting audiences with her enthusiasm for fiction and hip hop and new media and sculpture and photography. We're also very admirative of her commitment to addressing social and climate and species injustices in ways that recognize water's central role within these rising crises. So thank you for joining us and the floor is all yours. Anna, thank you for that lovely introduction. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for coming um, and, uh, and joining us on this wonderful evening. I feel very honored to be here and on, as part of such a, a fantastic panel. So, um, so thank you. Um, but yeah, leading on from that lovely introduction from Anna, I'm uh, very lucky. I feel very fortunate to have um, arrived uh, to, to be able to do what I do on a kind of day-to-day -day basis. It's not something that I really expected if you'd asked me maybe 10 15 years ago was this what i would be spending my time doing and it's been a really wonderful journey to get myself to this place where i am a, a storyteller for the oceans um but one uh who I, I mean i particularly love the fact that that the work i do allows me to 
to collaborate with many other wonderful creative people. And I feel like our work really, my work really is extraordinarily enhanced and I get to do really wonderful and interesting and unusual things because of those other people whose, whose work I can kind of combine with. Um, I should say like, I, I got here um, by a very unexpected pathway. Um, I was sort of planning early doors um, when I first started studying and, and, uh, and specializing in this world. I, I saw myself very clearly as being a scientist, a marine scientist. That's what I was studying at uh, university. Um, I'd had this enormous love of being in the ocean and, um, and diving and exploring and finding new things to see. And, and that for me has always been a driving force in, in what I do. But I kind of saw it being channeled down a kind of scientific and conservation route um, initially. I very much saw myself coming out of um, my degrees, which ended up being quite extensive, um, and three degrees in total. Um, but I saw myself coming out of that as, you know, as an academic, maybe working in the NGO sector, something like that, but, you know, contributing sort of directly in terms of the science I could provide. But I had this sort of strange um, side track happen to me during my PhD, which I really wasn't expecting, which was this like realization, or maybe it was just something new. It wasn't there before, but this, um, this realization that I love um, telling stories and, and sharing um, ideas about the oceans and what lives there specifically and the troubles that they, that sea life faces. Um, I discovered that I like writing. Uh, I discovered I like talking um, on live stages to people at sort of festivals and that sort of thing and, and on radio. And so I had the opportunity to kind of go down this slightly different path, which is what I'm still exploring today. And it has led me to some really wonderful collaborations. Um, and I want to talk to you about some of those today. Um, and sort of give you a flavor, give you sort of a few specific examples of some of the work that I've been involved in. Um, and I guess all of it, what ties it all together for me, um, at least up until this point, is a feeling that what I'm bringing, to, bringing out to the world is this view of the oceans and ocean life, this hidden realm that um, is so important for so many reasons. You know, 90% of the living space on our planet is ocean, 70% of the surface, 90% of the living space, the biosphere is the ocean. So if we want to know life on Earth, we have to look into the ocean. And yet we, we can't, it's difficult, you know, it's, it's hidden beneath the waves. And so much of, of those great wonders require a kind of invested investigation and exploration. And in different ways, I feel my work is kind of taking glimpses of that and showing people and sort of help helping others to hopefully like it or certainly be interested, maybe even kind of love it as much as I do and see why those connections are important between human lives and, and the oceans too. And so for me, it's sort of words and stories, but the visual aspects um, I'm going to tell you about are some of the sort of opportunities I've had working with other artists and so on. It just to kind of, I feel really amplify those messages um, and bringing different audiences to this, this world of which I'm basically trying to just, you know, hook everybody on the oceans as much as possible. Um, so I'm going to try and switch over to my screen now. Um, oh, I have to press share. Sorry, I'm not particularly so like at this point, I'm going to say I want to give you um, the whole desktop and that's hopefully going to work. Let's try. Yeah, it's working. OK, and I'm going to shift to that. Have you got that? Hopefully. Perfect. Yes. Good. OK, so um, just some fish, which I will come back to briefly. But I guess I would just say initially, um, I don't really consider myself to be a visual, um, although maybe at some point down the line, I will start doing some more of it myself. All I really as far as I go with that in terms of sort of visual representation um, myself is a bit of underwater photography. I took these pictures, um, but basically with a, a compact um, underwater, a, a waterproof camera that can go to about 15 meters, no extra external lighting, nothing fancy at all, literally just snapshots. Mostly what I take are just snapshots of fish and animals that I want to help me uh, identify them. I am a fish watcher, just as there are bird watchers in this world, I am a fish watcher and I write lists and I keep score of the species that I see and a camera is really helpful. And occasionally an image comes out that's kind of rather lovely and beautiful. And um, so that's a few of them here. Um, but by and large, I leave that kind of, or I, 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 I rely on other much more brilliant artists and, and visualizers to help me with that kind of side of my work. And, um, you know, I've had some really wonderful opportunities. And one thing I've done is um, uh, I wrote um, an essay for a book of photography that um, Jason Takeris Taylor, who we're going to be hearing from shortly, um, of his underwater sculptures. And that for me um, 
was just a really lovely opportunity to just think about his work and you know the essay I wrote for that book um, is really about about coral reefs and the importance of them biologically and ecologically um, globally um, about artificial reefs and how this work um, that Jason creates you know creates a conservation value in that sense um, and also a little bit I mean not so much I kind of left the kind of interpretation stuff to 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 uh to others and carla who also wrote an essay in the book too but so for me i guess in that sense i was focusing on the kind of the science and the ecology of his work um but it was uh, you know a, a wonderful opportunity i'd been a fan of jason's work for, for a, long, a while at that point um and it was a great thing to be able to kind of bring my scientific perspective to to his work um but i'll i'll let jason tell you more about um what he does uh, in a moment um but i guess in terms of other people i work with and other um artists i guess there's two two general ways in which um that kind of comes about um one is if uh example so this is an example here of um some so for example i've you know i've written a story here for the guardian about sharks um and it's a case of me coming up with an idea for something writing a piece submitting it to um, a newspaper or, or a publisher of some sort and then the artwork is kind of done independently so so the artists are chosen and they respond to the work that i create the stories that i tell so this story here um why we need sharks the true nature of the ocean's monstrous villains it was a story about kind of yes this misinterpretation of these animals the fact that they're no i think the key message was how diverse and wonderful sharks are and um and i just love this image that was created by these wonderful artists the, there are a pair of um, women who work together they call themselves good wives and warriors um and uh you know they created this this i think just really striking image of um all the different shapes and creatures that sharks can be um you know and that was all, all my kind of writing down below it but um it's actually this particular story is, is sparked some some more collaborations between the two of us so it was really wonderful to discover their work and we kind of um, gelled over a love of the oceans and hopefully there's going to be some more um joint work between between the three of us uh, to come in the future um similar to that i want to show you this piece which is again something that was sort of just a an artist responding to my stories and my written work this is um a review actually of my latest book the brilliant abyss um in the new york times just a couple of weeks ago and again it was a piece that was done it was commissioned by the newspaper this in case it's by a wonderful artist chloe nicholas and she just created it was the front page of the new york book time new york times book review and it was a sort of you know almost full page really beautiful kind of again just sort of rich image of the deep ocean and what lives in the deep ocean and i absolutely um again kind of loved it different kind of feel to it but um i've really again felt it captured i don't know if she read the book in this case but maybe she read the review but um certainly kind of for me captured the life of the deep ocean really brilliantly so i guess those are examples of stories um that i've written and I've just kind of sent off into the world and all books I've written and, and people have responded. And I know that's kind of an exciting, just sort of little surprise I get at the end, but it's not something I'm directly involved with in terms of creating those artworks. Um, but that is um, something like I am more involved um, with, uh, with photographers and artists, different projects that I do. Now, I just want to unshare for a minute so you can see me, hang on, I go back see me a bit bigger so i'm going to wave some things at you hopefully this is going to work um there we go okay so if i stop sharing i should come back on full screen because i want to show you a couple of things i've done um and i don't have good pictures i just want to show you the objects um so i guess a couple more examples of when the stories that i write are really kind of in collaboration from the beginning with with artists and photographers and one of those is um, working for National Geographic magazine. And I was really lucky to get to work on what ended up being a front cover story, at least in some countries. I think this is the Dutch um, edition. It, in America, it was something else, um, which is fine. But um, this piece on emperor penguins by this fantastic photographer, Stefan Christman. And he, um, he spent two years in Antarctica um, with these extraordinary animals documenting their lives and came back with uh, you know, just a fabulous um, portfolio of images. He won the BBC Wildlife Photographer of the Year, one of the categories for some of these pictures he, he did. And so I was brought in kind of later in the day, but still kind of given the opportunity to speak with him, go through the images he had and figure out what was the story that I was gonna tell. 
about these creatures and particularly about the threat they face um, due to climate change. So this was really a story. If any of you speak Dutch, you can figure out what this is. <laughs> I should show you the English version. But it's a, it's a story about climate change, really, and how it's affecting these ice dependent birds down south. And for me, it was just such a wonderful opportunity to to work with someone who got to know um, not only kind of these animals scientifically, but you know, he's artistically been capturing their lives and, and focusing on that for two years. And I came in and um, worked out how to put the words down and how to also, the thing that was interesting, I find very interesting working with National Geographic is that the images, they are the stories. I mean, it is such a visual thing. It's such a visual uh, magazine um that there's two stories going on really there's the big the big kind of two thousand words in this case that i wrote in between and there's the captions and i don't know if you've if any of you read national geographic or if you've ever flipped through but um it's it's very specific to this magazine that you you have to tell the story within those captions because there are some people who only flip through and don't read the long versions um but also you know it's a chart it's more than that though the writing the captions for me is a really interesting time to to guide readers uh, at, to look think about those images it's that chance to really say look at this did you notice that have you seen what's going on here or interpreting and kind of the idea with those caption and i'm sort of still learning how to do it well but it, it's it's going to get readers to go back and look again and to start seeing things they didn't in those images um so for me working on those sorts of stories and i'm doing some more at the moment it's just such a lovely opportunity to as i say just work with those visual artists and those photographers who are capturing something just stunning on their on their cameras and i get the chance to kind of enhance that with my work um, i want to show you another thing that again i've got sort of in my hand rather than on the screen which is my first kids book that i've just came out earlier this year the great barrier reef which is obviously a beautiful thing as you can see as i hold it in front of you and again this was a case of me writing kind of slightly the other way around i wrote um i designed you know figured the contents and wrote a draft of it um but then worked fairly closely with the artist to produce um with lisk feng to produce this beautiful beautiful thing um you know and, and it's again a lesson it's been a lesson for me and i'm now working on several more kids books in just how to make artwork work so brilliantly with with science and with exploring ideas of what's in the ocean that's coral spawning um, and you know, even though I kind of had sort of an idea of what it, it might look like, it, she totally blew me away with the creations that she she, she drew. I mean, some of them are just, they're just stunning. Um, so this is a book by, I think, seven to 11 year olds. Um, so I'm still really, I mean, I'm absolutely adoring having this opportunity to explore um, how, how visually um, art can really enhance those sort of science and stories that I'm trying to tell. And it's something I really want to do more and more of. So um, that's been a really exciting and wonderful thing to be doing. Um, I, yeah, I just want to, I guess I'll tell you about, um, I'll show you one more story. I'm going to go back to sharing my screen again, hopefully. Let's see, is this working? Um, show you one more story that I did again with the photographer. And this is something else I do a fair amount of is, is working. Um, for BBC Wildlife magazine. And this is a photographer I wanted to just bring up because he's a fantastic underwater photographer called um, Shane Gross. Again, he's going to be award winning and he's going to be, you know, all over the place uh, anytime soon, I'm sure. He's doing really well, fantastic things already. But he, he shot this amazing scene of um, a lemon sharks in the Bahamas. So it's back to sharks again. Um, and it was a story I was brought to, um, kind of, you know, the magazine came to me and said, oh, do you want to write this piece about sharks? And they showed me Shane's pictures. And I was like, well, yeah, I do. <laughs> They're just um, stunning, stunning images. Sorry, the website's a bit messy, but you can hopefully get an idea of what these things look like. This was also in a magazine, but I thought I'd just show you the, the website version of it. This underwater view, I love the way he's kind of just got into the water and shown things from the shark's eye, the, the shark's view, really for me is what really sets his work apart um, and so i was talking about this article really is about sharks as, as animals and individuals and how they learn and how they make friends and how they're way smarter than you might imagine um, and i just think his images capture that so brilliantly and it just was again a real there's a crab eye view of a, of a predatory shark um again just a, a really interesting way of figuring out how my stories of sharks are really enhanced by that visual element um and you know it's just a striking thing to be involved in it's, it's really wonderful
I just want to finish um, before um, we open up to questions. I'm going to go back to my screen and show you sort of another really important part of the work I do is writing books, um, popular science books for adult readers. Um, and in particular, I've been really lucky to work with one artist, Aaron John Gregory, has done the last three covers of my books. Um, and it's always been a really a delightful opportunity for me to to collaborate. And I do really feel like these are the kind of the strongest collaborations I've had with an artist. Um, because he really involves me in this, and this is, I think, quite unusual. Not all not all authors get really such a chance to to do that. I've certainly done other books where I've just been given the cover and I've got no, no say in it. But I actually chose Aaron to work with because I thought his work is brilliant. He's also a fantastic marine scientist. He really understands the animals I'm trying to write about. A book about seashells, sparrows and time. Um, a book about fish, eye of the shoal, and my latest book about the deep sea, brilliant abyss. And he's done all these and just so brilliantly um, captured the idea of what I wanted him to show, but also enhanced it as well. And I thought I'd just take you through quickly how we got to um, one of the covers. Um, I'll go through Spirals in Time um, and show you what happened for that. Um, uh, originally, I was going to call the book The Flight of the Argonauts. I'm really terrible at deciding what to call my books. It's such a hard thing to do. And that was one title idea we had. And Argonauts are these amazing little octopuses that make shells. And so I basically just wanted them on the front cover as well. So, so this was his first ideas of sketches of what that could look like. But then my editor said, well, it's not a book about Argonauts. You, you need to call it something else. So that was out. And we eventually came up with Spirals in Time. I don't know where it came from. It just popped out of my head. Um, so this was his first sketch. She was like, well, maybe we, and I said, well, what I want is lots of shells, but with animals in them. I don't want them to be dead shells. I want them to be living mollusks. And this was the first sketch she came up with. And we were like, yeah, but we need space for words. Me and my editor. So three of us were basically sharing ideas. Um, books have to have words on the front cover. So he's like, okay, fine. How about we have a spiral of shells, a uh, spiral in time, but we could have one coming out or coming down the, the page. And we were like, coming round, coming out at you, please. So the left-hand side, um, this is going between California and London, I should say that he's, um, Aaron's based in California. So he's like, okay, cool. We'll do like a big swell front back cover, something like this. Um, then he, you know, he draws in the characters and this is actually inked in by hand. He does this, um, with, uh, I think with paintbrush and ink, um, and just, uh, lots of all sorts of tentacly, wonderfully intricate creatures. Um, here's a picture, here he is. I'm working in a studio. The coloring is done uh, on a tablet and then, yeah. And then it becomes this wonderful thing. And he, we mocked up various covers and figured out what kind of color scheme we wanted. And we all decided that we liked the white, although we now discover the problem is that white gets a bit grubby if it's kept on a shelf too long. So maybe next time we go for blue, but those are the two covers we came up with for the paperback and the hardback. So it's just a really, I mean, I've basically sort of spend my time working with Aaron, sending him lists of creatures I want him to draw. And um, he does so brilliantly. It also comes up with other suggestions. Um, these, but this book also has interior illustrations for each chapter, which kind of capture what each chapter is about. There's a chapter about um, deadly cone snails and how their chemicals are used um, to make new medicines. And so he drew us that one, uh, a chapter about sea butterflies, these plankton, which are very vulnerable to um, climate change. And so he drew us those and oh a chapter about ancient extinct shells so there was an ammonite which is just super cool um so yeah so that was um i have the uh, spirals in time we did a similar thing for either shoal i won't go through this in too much detail but we were like this is a book about fish and i want it to be you know kind of surely so these were ideas and he came up with these as mocks and um and that was the eventual kind of front back cover so i mean that back and um, actually, in the end, we had to take those back guys off because, again, the words had to go on the book. It was such a shame. It was like, you have to have that bit where they go, oh, this book is great, blah, blah, blah. And it was like, the picture of fish is so much nicer, but it had to go inside instead. <laughs> but it's such a cool thing. And you can now get T-shirts of these. That's, I think it's just such such cool. <laughs> he, he has like a company that sells T-shirts too. And this one is a bestseller, as you can imagine. Um, and yeah, and he's just done this, um, The Brilliant Abyss for us, including, oh, sorry, here's some of the internal drawings from the um, Eye of the Shoal. Um, you're just doing things that I'm not even thinking about in terms of spacing these animals out. You know, I go, I want a sunfish and a puffer fish and these things. And he's like, okay, this is how they're going to be arranged and creates these, these wonderful things for us. Um, and again, just makes it look really beautiful and symmetrical on the page. So these are full page illustrations in either shoal to open each chapter. Whereas those other ones were just at the top for spirals in time. So, you know, I adore his work. This is from the latest book from the deep sea 
book um these are the end plates actually so they're inside the cover and i asked him if he would do a map of the deep ocean sort of pointing out things that happen in, throughout the book so it's sort of orienting readers to what we're looking at but it actually kind of draws upon this um, map that was drawn in the 70s by a wonderful woman called marie tharp who um, was basically the scientist who helped create the first map of the deep sea um, the first full map and so it's a kind of it's a callback to the way she drew hers it appeared in national geographic and it's sort of it's a sort of a hint towards that um and he also did us a lovely cut through of the deep kind of going deeper down here and showing the sorts of creatures that live at different depths and yeah and he did us the front cover and the book i should say just finally as well as erin's illustrations the deep sea book um also has photography so these are a lot of some of the images that appear in the center pages of the book I did have um, the chance to kind of have a, a really nice um, color insert, which, you know, is really lovely. And I've been really lucky to choose images like these ones I'm showing you right now, which is those deep sea creatures shot against black are just so stunning with the, the kind of gelatinous um, light quality to them. Um, and, uh, you know, and sort of just some of the weird shapes and creatures that uh, live in the deep. And, um, and my editors, you know, were like, we could get them drawn. And that was, I would have loved to have seen Aaron do that, but in a way it was like, well, we just need the full color kind of hit on this. So, so we went with that in the end. And that's what's, um, that's what's gracing the pages of the deep sea. So, um, so yeah, and that's, they're the front covers. The US um, didn't go for Aaron's front cover. They went for a picture, uh, um, one of these photographs of amazing deep sea creature, but he did the, the British cover, which is on the left here with a whole bunch of different creatures there too. Um, and it's, it's just been a, a wonderful experience as an author to be able to work that closely and to bring those creatures that are hidden away uh, to life on the page. So, um, so yeah, I think that's all I was going to chat about. Shall I, shall I stop sharing that so you can? Uh... Yes, why don't, why don't we all come back to our images? And there we go. I, I, I know we don't have a lot of time. I'm just going to ask you a quick but maybe a overly complicated question, but it's not every day, as I mentioned, that you find scientists who are really openly engaging and welcoming art into their work, which is usually considered to be in a different sphere of value instead of fact. So I'm wondering, um, obviously, your collaborations are not just artists illustrating your work, but even the titles of your book, I'm noticing that they are very visually oriented. So the eye of a shoal and spirals and then this beautiful, um, yes, last book, I forgot to mention, uh, Beautiful Abyss, um, that it's um, really seeming to be uh, recognized as a very important part in this, um, in this uh, give and take between something that has aesthetic value and something that also is um, of a different nature. And I'm wondering if you have had difficulties sort of um, defending that choice uh, maybe to other scientific colleagues or if that's ever posed a, a problem for you, how you see that articulation. Yeah. I don't, not too much of a problem. I guess occasionally I come across people who say, um, who kind of question the accuracy. I, I think the images, and certainly Aaron, Aaron works very hard to, to, to do really accurate images for me in, in the books. Um, and occasionally people say, oh, that color's not quite right. Or there's like maybe some little thing. So scientists can get very picky about their very specific thing. And if I should, maybe I should just confess to say that the front cover of this guy, um, this fish would not normally be quite so red as this. The, the reason that happened, and it kind of was a bit unfortunate because it was really too late for us to change it. And I also didn't want to, because I really like it. But um, Aaron drew that from a preserved specimen, um, which do change color after they're preserved. It's normally really dark. It would just be a kind of a very black fish. So you wouldn't really be able to see it. But I did have an email um, from a friend of mine, a colleague of mine, who said, you know, that's not quite right. And I was like, oh, I don't know what to do now. Cause I don't, you know, I, I agree things should be accurate, but it was at that point, it was too late too. We had already gone to press, so we couldn't do anything about it, but I did feel bad about that. So I think, you know, occasionally you get someone who's just a little bit kind of precious about, and I understand that, you know, the thing they know best, but no, normally, no, I guess, um, actually, I think a lot of scientists, um, at least in, in my sphere, totally behind the idea of, of crossing that or, or you know, getting rid of that boundary and, and, sh and understanding the, um, the importance and the value of, of bringing in more visual elements. Um, I mean, especially in ocean science, because so much of it is, is not obviously kind of visual to other people. And, and there's so much to see and there's so much to look at, you know, and that's, um, such an important part, I think, of, of getting people to engage and to empathize and to be interested is to be able to look at it. Um, you know, I often get people say to me, um, 
you know, you know, they love reading my books, but they often have like the internet or, you know, a tablet open next to them and they go searching for images of stuff that maybe hasn't been illustrated. Um, cause I do write very visually and, that, and it's all in my head. I can see it. And so I write it down. Um, um, but I think sometimes they also want to just actually see it as opposed to my words too. So I get, and they say that the two go well together, but yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Rainy Dimerson has a question. Rainy, would you like to ask your question yourself? Sure, thanks. I was just curious about um, how you choose between doing an, using an illustration or a photo. They're both so beautiful, and but they have such different... Um, you know, they kind of register so differently. Um, and maybe maybe you don't decide, because I know you mentioned a lot of the, the artists or editors make those choices, but I was just kind of curious, like between using an illustration versus a photo, because a lot of the illustrations were so realistic. Um, how do you decide? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know quite how we decide. I mean, partly just the restriction on what's um, going to in the book. Um, there's only so many pages in terms of those sort of adult books I do. Um, these guys, you know, you've got eight pages for the photos, probably unless you're really lucky and you get two inserts, in which case you get 16. Um, whereas I push really hard to get the artwork in there, to get Aaron's work in there. And, and I have to say, I, I wanted more of his artwork in here, but it, the, the publishers um, wouldn't wouldn't go down that route. Um, you know, they should, as as is absolutely right, he needs to be paid. And I try pushing very hard for him to be paid as well as possible. And, and when the budget's not there, we just can't do it. So... Um, so I guess for me as well, I mean, I love I, I love having both, but I, I especially love the illustrations because there's there is that element of of adding even more aesthetics to it. It's almost that kind of Ernst Heckel down that line of arranging things beautifully on the page. It's like these are real creatures. This is a real jellyfish. It really does look pretty much like this, but let's make it look even more beautiful. If it was just a scientific illustration, it wouldn't have that symmetry. It wouldn't have that just the hidden kind of, you know, it's so skillfully arranged on the page. Um, so for me, I think that's the added, what we get even more from in the illustrations is that sort of artistic eye of how to make these things really, really sing beautifully on the page. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, so everyone will have a chance to talk to Dr. Scales again in a little bit, but let's um, um, pass the floor over to Anne-Laure who will um, now introduce our next guest. Thank you very much, Anna. Yes, it's our great pleasure to welcome Jason Decay's Taylor today, uh, the famous sculptor, uh, environmentalist and professional underwater photographer. Uh, Jason graduated from the London Institute of Arts in 1998 with a BA Honours in Sculpture, and he's the first of a new generation of artists to shift the concepts of the land art movement into the realm of the marine environment. Um, his permanent site-specific sculptural works are exhibited in submerged and tidal marine environments, exploring the themes of conservation and environmental activism. Over the past 20 years, Jason has been one of the first artists to consider the underwater realm as a public art space, and he's best known for his numerous large-scale underwater museums and sculpture parks. Uh, he gained international notoriety in 2006 with the creation of the world's first underwater sculpture park uh, situated off the west coast of Grenada in the West Indies. Uh, and it's now listed as one of the 25 wonders of the world. Uh, from there, Jason has gone on to produce more than 1,000 public terrestrial and underwater sculptures worldwide, um, which, um, uh, which are visited by thousands of visitors um, every week. Uh, work, would like to insist on the fact that working alongside marine biologists, uh, Jason uses pH uh, neutral, resilient, stable and environmentally responsive materials and his sculptures also incorporate habitat spaces for marine life. Um, his pioneering art encourages environmental awareness, instigates social change and leads us, the public, to fully take in the beauty of the underwater world. So the floor is yours, Jason. Thank you very much for being here. 
No, thank you. Uh, thank you for the, the lovely introduction and, um, and of course the opportunity to be able to share my work. It's, uh, um, it, it's always such a great privilege. Um, I'm so sure you don't want to just see a picture of me and I'm a visual artist and, and I much prefer people uh, looking at my work rather than uh, seeing me speak. Um, so I was going to, uh, going to share my screen. There we go. Um, and I was just going to do a little bit of the trajectory of my career, show how my works have uh, changed over time and how I've started off and how each different environment I've worked has, has required a different res response to work with uh, different communities and different cultures, uh, but also greatly different um, marine life. So each one I've tried to sort of uh, adapt, the, adapt the methods and the processes and the concepts. Um, and obviously this, uh, this sort of spans around uh, 15, 16 years. And, and over time, we've sort of, you know, we've become more acutely aware of all the different uh, threats facing the planet and, and, and facing our oceans. So the work has tried to respond to some of those issues. Um, so we'll go into it. Um, I first started off in uh, 2006. Um, sorry, this is the first when I was at Art College. Um, I started uh, producing life casts. So I did a lot of training in uh, casting people. Uh, making these plaster casts and then I would part of my degree was taking them around to different environments and I made quite large sort of groups of people almost 30 40 um, and then I'd take them around to different different areas of London to urban settings to forests to coastlines and see how the works changed according to uh, the location they were placed in and as I started to sort of uh, monitor these these installations I realized how when I left them in in situ for some time they started to change and they started to adapt and they started to to sort of take on the the patina of their environment and I thought that was quite a nice metaphor for how we all live in communities and how we are so shaped by our surroundings by our environment by our community and so I thought that was something that would be good to do and at the time I was also a, a scuba diver um, I'd lived abroad and I'd uh, spent quite a lot of my time underwater and I thought I'd be wonderful to do this underwater but being in London and being a student it was it was a little bit difficult uh, so I kind of put it on the back burner um, and then later on almost 10-15 uh, years later um, I found myself working in the Caribbean as a diving instructor um, and it was a moment that was uh, quite sort of pivotal for me because it a large hurricane Hurricane Ivan um, came through the Caribbean um, and decimated lots of different parts of the reef systems and, and obviously on land. And so what happened, you had all these sort of coastal fringing reefs that were really heavily impacted. And what was happening was that the tourists that were then visiting were just concentrating all their activities um, into, the, into the last remaining pristine reefs that was putting quite a large pressure on them. Um, so I worked together with some of the local dive centers and we thought, you know, if I came up with an underwater installation, a sculpture park, maybe that would distract people from these natural areas um, and bring them into areas where they would cause less impact. Um, and, you know, I could do this work underwater in this incredibly new space and, and not only draw these visitors away, but also provide a sort of platform for, for corals. Um, so this particular piece um, was called Vicissitudes, and it was a, a ring of, of children, coast uh, cast from the local community. And again, it was, it was made from materials that would um, encourage marine life. Uh, this is probably after about two or three years of, of being submerged. And I thought it was really fascinating how, you know, like children absorb their surroundings and how they're shaped and morphed by their, their environment that they're in. And, uh, and this ring of children was quite interesting because, it, again, according to which direction the current was coming from, uh, how clear the water was, uh, the quality of the water was, was how it affected heavily uh, what type of growth that we'd see on the surfaces. Um, so I spent around uh, almost three or four years building a whole series of sculptures, um, over 65 in total. Um, and from that, I started to get um, other projects. Sorry, my screen's frozen. Oh, there we go. Um, I started to get uh, 
other projects. This was um, a piece in, in Mexico, in, in the Caribbean, where they had a similar issue where um, they did some research with the, with the marine park and they worked out that uh, when they closed some of the natural reefs, they actually found that those natural reefs were recovering, had much better uh, regeneration, much better growth. And so they, the marine park thought, oh, we better close more reefs. Um, which then caused quite an outcry from the, um, uh, you know, the tourist industry and all the local operators. Uh, so they sort of said, if you close these reefs, you have to offer an alternative. Um, and that's when I sort of, they, they asked me to, to come along. And I did a similar installation, but on a much larger scale. So this, this particular installation has around uh, 500 people in. Again, uh, mostly all life casts. And I wanted to make it on a, on a, large, a larger scale that it, so it created more kind of um, negative space. So it harbored more of these sort of nooks and crannies and uh, areas where marine life could really sort of uh, escape predation. And it was very successful. Yeah, it's quite interesting. You go diving there and uh, there's this, this huge shoal of fish that swims around on top of it. And then any threat that comes in, all the, the school of fish just sort of descends uh, into, the, into the sort of feet and legs of the, of the works. And uh, they, they're all they're changing dramatically. I keep seeing pictures on on Instagram, uh, and all of these works now have you know very very dense coral coverage. Um, this is how they sort of slowly start to, to transform, um, and there's a real sort of uh, biological process that goes through all these different stages of, of algal growth, of coralline algae, uh, of kind of uh, juvenile coral polyps that start start attaching. And it's really fascinating to watch. And I, I team up with local marine biologists that do, do studies on them and, and do little quadrants and count the number of species. And um, it's really interesting to, to watch their change. And it's not always, they always change positively. Sometimes they might be affected by uh, you know, uh, high water temperatures or, or runoff from the shore. And so they, they go, they flux. Sometimes they have a lot of growth. Sometimes they're, they're inundated with, with harmful algae. So. Um, they sort of go through very different phases. Um, I also uh, did some works which were actually planting corals. So this was taking uh, Gorgonian fan coral, uh, which is quite often uh, ripped off the reef during uh, a high storm activity. And, it, and they get thrown off the reef and they, and they get sort of uh, washed around on the, on the seabed where, where they, they end up dying because they can't filter the, the water. Um, and so I created this piece uh, called Resurrection, which was about replanting these, these broken fragments and, and trying to get them to sort of uh, almost be like a phoenix where it kind of uh, was regenerating and, and uh, moving with the, with the current. Um, and it, it's quite interesting. It's, I tried to tell a lot of sort of stories with all, all of the artwork and I kind of range from being incredibly pessimistic <laughs> to being, being trying to be uh, hopeful. And, and it's interesting engaging how that motivates people or demotivates people. Um, but I, it, it's quite hard, I think, to, I don't like to be in denial about what's happening, but um, I also, at the same time, to, to change people's minds or to instigate any kind of um, engagement, I, I think you also have to provide some sort of optimism and, and, and hope. Um, this was a, another piece, which is probably more on the negative scale, which was uh, called the Anthropocene. Um, and it was sort of this, you know, uh, uh, young child sort of left with this kind of uh, in, industrial world and uh, this world that's heavily uh, dependent on fossil fuels. Um, and it was in Mexico and it's based on the sort of classic uh, uh, Volkswagen Beetle, which is still very, very popular in Mexico. It's still the sort of uh, taxi that everyone uses to, to get around. Um, and I wanted to change the design of some of the reefs where on the larger installation, I had this very large sort of um, uh, lobster population, which was, which was fantastic. Um, but what, what was happening was all the fishermen were also finding that, that it was a great place to, to stock up all the local hotel buffets, um, which meant that I had to sort of reconfigure it so the local fishermen couldn't uh, get the lobsters quite so easy. Um, so this, base, this piece came about um, and it actually uh, sliced in half. It had all these sort of lobster hotels inside um, and it had these entrance doors which allowed lobsters to sort of go around foraging at night 
but then during the day return and, and be protected. Um, and it was very unsuccessful for around a year. There was absolutely nothing living in it. And, and, I, and I thought it was a, a complete failure. Um, but I went around three years later and, and it was completely packed. And all I could see were the antlers and the, <laughs> and the feelers of all the crustaceans inside. And uh, yeah, it was very satisfying. Um, this is another piece from Mexico. And, and besides the um, environmental aspects to it, I'm also just fascinated as an artist working underwater. It's, uh, it's just a, a magnificent space. You know, you have light patterns that, you know, completely different. You're looking through the lens of the sea, which, you know, changes colours, magnifies things, um, you know, causes light to be refracted in all, all these different ways. Um, and I barely even, you know, scratched the surface. And Helen was talking earlier about, you know, how we've, we, you know, know so little <laughs> still about the biology underwater, you know, and I think autistically, um, you know, so there's so much more to explore. Uh, this was a, a piece where I wanted to, um, working underwater is like working in a, in a desert, you know, it's so, so vast and so, endless that it's quite difficult as an installation uh, to fill that space and that's why I kind of end up working making you know 500 figures or this particular piece is around five meters high it's around 40 tons um, and I really try to sort of create something that is an attraction that holds people that holds people's attention for long enough that it it becomes a, a valuable uh, a tourism asset uh, so this piece is called Ocean Atlas um, and it's this idea that the, our seas are collapsing. Um, and this, this young girl is a young uh, Bahamian student. Um, and it, this, this younger generation is, is supporting the sea and, and, uh, um, and, and, and yeah, uh, stopping the decline. It was all built in levels. It was so heavy um, that I had to build it in layers and then try to sort of um, assemble it underwater, which was, which was pretty difficult. I then um, did quite a lot of work in, in tropical regions. And, and I've, again, I, I really feel that my work is about sort of creating a, you know, a portal into the sea. It's about telling stories about the sea and, um, and introducing people to the, this fantastic world and particularly people that, you know, maybe didn't consider themselves as mariners or, or seafarers. It's, it's about people who, you know, from all walks of life get to see some of the incredible things underwater. And I completed many of these tropical projects and I thought, you know, I need to, a new challenge, I need to work somewhere different in the world. Um, and I got the opportunity to work in the Canary Islands in, in the Atlantic Ocean. And it was, yeah, a completely different proposition. And instantly I was just, I just fell in love with the space because I never realized but the sea actually has, you know, a thousand different shades of blue. And according to where you are, you know, that, that, that blue color really affects how you relate to the works, how you experience the works. Um, and this, I just had this incredible Atlantic blue that made everything feel otherworldly and felt, felt sort of divorced from reality, almost like a, a sort of uh, a dreamscape. It was, it was really fascinating to work with. Um, and at that time, I, I was also very sort of acutely aware of, of climate change. And I really wanted my work to start sort of, um, documenting it and, it and documenting it in a way that future generations will know that we knew what we were doing, <laughs> we knew this would happen, um, but yet we ignored it. And so I, I kind of felt that if I could make monuments to suggest that, it would might maybe guilt us into, <laughs> into some kind of action, or we could just feel utterly ashamed of ourselves when we're, when we're older. Um, so this piece is called um, Crossing the Rubicon. Um, so it was a piece of a, uh, it was a sort of uh, a wall with a with a portal through it, and it's about this crossing, passing through this door of of no return. And obviously, um, you know, as 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 we all know, we're we're, we're approaching that point quite soon. Um, and I also didn't have a sort of high expectations for the marine life to colonise it. It wasn't in a tropical space that has maybe you know some of the diversity as other other areas. Um, but I was just blown away by the, the number of species, you know, how many thousands of fish, you know, I actually got to the point where you couldn't see the sculptures because there were so many fish. Um, and they sort of just hauntingly swam around you in circles. It was, 
um, quite amazing. Unfortunately, the fishermen very quickly uh, clocked on to it. Um, and even though we did have uh, patrol boats and, and marine rangers, they, they managed to uh, take some of the fish at night, um, but, the, but they're, they're still being repopulated. Um, this is another piece, again, a sort of multi-human uh, multi installation. Um, and this was uh, called the Human Gyre. And it was, again, trying to create a piece that had lots of different um, spaces, nooks and crannies, lots of sort of intricate areas for, for colonization. Um, and this was about how, you know, we're all in this gyre, we're all subject to um, the, the forces of the planet, you know, nature dictates how, how we live, not we don't dictate how the natural environment should be. Um, again, this, this, we had these huge schools, it's a real sort of chain reaction, you get these small juvenile fish that live in the little spaces, then you get more predators that come in. Uh, you know, this particular piece has lots of angel sharks, which are actually extinct in the UK. Um, and we've seen quite large populations and they've all just been attracted to these very young fish that live in the installation and they hide in the sand and just, just pick them off slowly. And then moving on from there, I sort of, again, wanted to explore a different environment. Um, so I, I got a commission to do a piece in Oslo in a, in a fjord. Um, and I wanted to do something very, very different. I was exploring this new type of cement that, that actually floated underwater. Um, and I wanted to sort of portray how we, we're so connected, you know, our lives are intri intrinsically connected to, to the marine world. Uh, so there's all these sort of floating figures that are connected with these umbilical cords to, to the sea floor or the fjord floor. Um, and it's quite a fascinating because it, 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 you know, in the winter, it ices over. Um, and then in autumn, all the autumn leaves turn, turn the water this incredible gold colour. And you, you wouldn't expect it, you know, in the heart of a big city, um, you know, this was a fjord that was quite heavily polluted with, with mercury, with lots of contaminants. Um, but underwater, it was actually such a beautiful, beautiful space. Um, and then again, I, I thought, you know, what I wonder, it's not going to, uh, you know, have schools of angel sharks living on it. Um, what's going to, what kind of growth is it, will it get? Um, and it was quite, quite amazing. You know, we had all these uh, formations of uh, sea squirts, there's all these shrimps, uh, we got barnacles, oysters, uh, and it was just a sort of a wealth of marine life, you know, after only kind of six months. And again, it was interesting because they were quite small creatures to begin with, um, but very quickly, you know, all these uh, small, small species brought in some of the sort of more predatory fish. Um, and then it got to a point where I actually started seeing seals swimming around, the, uh, you know, picking off the fish. I started to see seagulls. I was, I was diving once and I actually had a seagull that swam past me underwater, uh, just pulling off the mussels and, and, uh, and eating them. So it was just yeah, really interesting to see, you know, how, how different environments have, have such de different ecosystems. Um, this was a piece, again, I, I wanted to sort of look at uh, tidal environments and see how I could, how I could work with, with um, in, a, in, a, in a very large tidal environment. This is on the River Thames, uh, opposite the Houses of Parliament. Um, and I, I wanted to do more kind of, um, more activist pieces, you know, really, really putting stuff in front of, of politicians, of, of the Shell headquarters, um, some of the big developments that, that run all along the Thames. Uh, this is based on the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Um, and obviously the, the heads of the horses have been replaced with um, uh, petroleum pumps. And so this, this piece actually was subject to almost uh, eight meters of water every day came in and out and uh, completely uh, submerged all of the pieces. Um, and visitors could actually uh, look at the installation from the, from the sidewalk or, or actually descend onto the, onto the beach. Uh, that brought me on to more tidal works. I started to get quite fascinated with, you know, how these how these water levels change. It change, um, and I wanted to work in somewhere different. This was in the Indian Ocean, uh, in the, in the Maldives, and it's a sort of uh, uh, it's called a corallarium. It was a piece, an area where we uh, propagated propagated um, corals, um, but I kind of wanted to see if I could almost 
contain tourists in, in an attraction and let the marine life come and go. So it's like a sort of inverted zoo uh, where we were, we were contained, um, but marine life could colonize it. And it was in a very, very large lagoon, which, was, which only had sand, sand substrate. So it was actually very, very quickly that the marine life moved in because there wasn't actually that, that many uh, places to sort of seek refuge. Um, this is inside. It was very shallow. It was only a couple of meters deep, um, and, the, and the tide kind of um, came up and down the figures. And this this particular piece was obviously about sort of some of the low lying islands that um, are going to be heavily impacted by sea level rises. Um, I then moved on to the Great Barrier Reef. So I, I have done quite a bit of travelling in the last few years. Um, and this, I'm still working on this commission at the moment. It's a series of, of sculptures um, on the Barrier Reef around the Townsville region. Um, and it's one of the sort of headquarters for, for marine science in the world. It has a, a really big uh, university, the James Cook University, and it has the Australian Institute of, of Marine Science. And I wanted to work with local um, marine biologists to sort of, uh, you know, use some of those facts and figures that they produce and really turn it into sort of into something visual that that people could understand instantly or, or see the an immediate risk. Um, and this piece is called Ocean Siren, and uh, she's connected to a weather station that's out on on John Brewer Reef, uh, on the Great Barrier Reef. And in real time, there's a a three G sender that sends back data to the mainland that changes her color according to what color color the seas um, and, and how long those uh, prolonged temperatures uh, of, of, of sea change are. Sea change is being a blue to a, uh, uh, an orange to a sort of deep red when sea temperatures uh, are high for prolonged periods of time. And this is right along the coastline near the city. So the idea is that in real time, people can kind of see, you know, uh, how our reefs are affected by the, these climatic changes. Uh, this is also a piece there working um, with the with the um, local community of build this underwater um, greenhouse. So we wanted to uh, create a site where we could work on uh, coral propagation. Um, we could sort of celebrate some of the the science that was was happening in in the region. Um, so it sort of features all these different areas of potting. Um, the idea is to have sensors that uh, test the salinity and uh, the the um, pH content and and all the different units have different um, different size dwellings for different types of species. And you can see this is a, a close up of one of the pieces. So I'm still working on on, on future installations. At, at the moment in the studio, um, I'm building a, a, a third installation, which is celebrating all the different uh, marine scientists um, and their work. So there's a sort of a, a snorkel trail based on, on, on leading coral experts. Um, I've then been working uh, back in Europe. I'm now based in, in the UK. Uh, and this is a, a piece in the Mediterranean, uh, just off the coast of uh, France, uh, near, near Cannes. Uh, and this is situated in, this, in between a series of, of Posidonia meadows um, and again, I was, I was commissioned by the, the government to um, <coughs> recount some of the local stories, um, but also to sort of uh, highlight how the importance of these uh, Posidonia meadows are to the, are to the coastline. Uh, and this, this particular piece was about the ocean being a mask, how when we look at the ocean from the surface, it seems so uh, resilient and endless and robust. Um, but actually beneath the surface, it's incredibly fragile, uh, you know, incredibly sensitive and, and, and imperiled. And so I was trying to sort of uh, get that, that, that sensation across, a, a, I think it was six works in total. Um, earlier this year, I've also, uh, that's a, another piece from that, from that series. And then uh, finally, uh, this is the latest work, which is um, in Cyprus, uh, also in the Mediterranean. And I've long been interested in, in, in forests. And I think uh, we quickly 
understanding the importance of forests. And I think we, we can relate to, you know, wanting to, to protect them very easily. Um, and so I wanted to create this idea of an underwater forest and the same way that terrestrial forests, you know, are great centers of, of biodiversity and, and harbor lots of life. I wanted to, to try and, um, you know, uh, create something similar underwater. And I wanted to work throughout the water column. So it wasn't just about creating reefs on the sea floor. Um, it was about sort of rising up to, to six meters tall um, and creating a sort of network of, of trees and, and diff a variety of, of different areas to, to inhabit. Uh, and again, sort of, it's a quite a large installation uh, with over 80 sculptures and each is sort of set out in a linear tour and each, each installation tells a different story. Um, and it's kind of a, uh, based around hide and seek and, and children, every generation trying to sort of find out who's responsible and find out, you know, what, what's behind the, uh, the, you know, the current situation that we live in. So there's a series of sort of uh, pieces. Uh, this was installing it. It's quite a big, quite a sort of uh, uh, difficult installation to install. There, there were almost 12 tons, 12 tons in weight. Um, and we had to assemble them all on this sand substrate. Uh, and, and trees are quite uh, difficult. They're structurally, you know, they're, they're very top heavy that can get uh, caught up in the waves. So we had to design these really large bases that that would be fixed to the sea floor. And finally, this is the, the sort of last uh, image of, the, of all the works with the, with the um, pieces in between. Um, and I'm actually going there next week to watch, see how it's been colonized. Um, uh, they've just discovered a, a nudibranch that they've never found um, in Cyprus before, the first of its kind ever recorded. And then they found it on one of these, these leaves of the forest. So, I'm quite intrigued to go and see how it's changed. Um, but that's all, that's all my work to date. There's still many more, but I know we're short on time, so I, I'm gonna stop here. Um, but thank you so much for listening. And if you've got any questions, um, feel free. Mm. Thank you very much. That's absolutely fascinating. There are actually a lot of questions. Uh, we'll probably pick uh, two or three uh, among them. Um, there's a question by Juliette, uh, whether, your sculptures have ever been uh, vandalized? Have, have you ever uh, encountered that problem, vandalization? Yes, yes, sometimes. Um, and that's part of the sort of, part of the work of each in installation. And, and quite often why I call installations museums, because I want people to have that uh, same relationship as they would in a, in, a, in, a, in a land museum. I want them to apply those sort of uh, principles to the sea. And so we, we do try to sort of educate visitors and, and guides about not touching the sculptures. Um, obviously, it damages the sculptures, but also damages the marine life on them. Uh, but saying that, you know, people sit on them, people carve their names in them. Um, it, 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 it certainly happens. Um, and, you know, obviously I, can, I can quite often see it on social media. Yes. Um, um, and uh, there was also a question about the the, the, the uh, the shift from museums to social media uh, in the uh, exhibition and closure of, of artworks. Um, um, can I uh, can I find that that question again? Uh, or maybe um, we can also invite uh, Norian. Yeah, Norian. Like yes, would you like to ask your question then, Norian? Um, yes. Okay. Uh, actually, it's two questions, but they are both linked. Um, so let me get my notes back. Okay, so uh, do you believe that without social medias, your work would have had the same impact? And because of that, do you think that social media uh, is becoming the new and principal place for art to be shown? Um, I, I definitely yeah, attribute some of some of my success to, to having social media. I think if I'd, I'd started this career, 30 years ago, it would have been much, much harder. Um, and as a result, I, I do put an incredible amount of time and effort into documenting all the process, taking good images. Um, it, it's almost part of the, part of the artwork. And it, get, it, it sometimes gets a little bit uh, ridiculous where I am curating it or sometimes for, for the imagery. So I'll, 
um, position them in certain ways where the sunlight hits it at, at the right direction. Um, so certainly, yeah, that, that's definitely a, a, an important element. Um, saying that, I'm not a huge fan of social media myself. Um, I do see it as a as a um, a networking tool rather than a than a socialising tool. Um, and I, but I do think it's very good for yeah for sharing work and sharing your ideas and reaching large audiences for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, so um, do we have t time for one last question or, or um, um, yes, th there was also a question about the, uh, 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 the fact of working in a marine environment, how that changed the uh, very materiality of your uh, practice, uh, how it changed the types of material that you use and, and your vision of, of art. Yes, I mean the, the materials are a critical element. Um, it's it's very different as a, a traditional sculptor. Most most uh, public work is made from metals um, or castings, bronze castings, uh, stainless steel castings, and that's not something that that's uh, very sustainable underwater. It, it's it's heavily impacted by the salinity, um, and also doesn't really encourage much uh, marine growth. So part of it has been trying to develop materials that are sustainable, that have a surface area that's, that's pH neutral, um, and they're also designed to last for hundreds of years, that they're, they're, they're mostly inert. Um, some of the pieces I have used stainless steel in, some of the larger structures, uh, but most of the pieces are, are inert um, and, and designed not to last for, for a long time. Um, but I'm also continuously improving it, and uh, I'm very aware of the carbon footprint of, of cement, which is what I've used quite a bit of. Um, so at the moment, I'm actually using a new series of uh, geopolymer cements that are almost carbon free, uh, but also harbour life in, in the same way. Thank you very much, Dave, Jason. Uh, I will uh, then turn to Camilla, who will introduce our groomet to us all um, for the next, uh, for the last um, uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anlor. Um, Al Grumet, thank you. We are honored to receive Al here with us for the seminar. Al Grumet is a multimedia artist and a board member of um, Artworks for Change, an organization established in 2008 that strives to harness the transformative power of art to promote awareness, provoke dialogue, and inspire action. As an artist, Al Grumet creates storytelling projects and digital exhibitions that address critical social and environmental issues. As a climate activist, he works with grassroots organizations, emerging young activists and educators to promote national and local action on climate change. Al's works combine the tools of digital photography with the voice of traditional painting he draws upon Mashiva's sense of humor in his depiction of human choice gone wrong. In his works, Al Grumet presents environmental dramas that merge fact and fiction and feature ghostly figures who dissolve into dystopian landscape. For our seminar, Al Grumet will give an overview of artworks for change and present the exhibition Footing the Bill, as well as the Jason DeCaris Taylor's digital gallery. Uh, thank you so much, Al, for having accepted our invitation. The floor is yours. Thank you, Kamala, for that wonderful uh, introduction. And uh, it's really wonderful that, uh, that I was invited to speak here today with, with such a, a terrific panel. Uh, Jason and Helen, I found your talks to be very engaging and inspiring. Um, I'm going to uh, share my presentation screen now. Great. So uh, Artworks for Change, as Kamala mentioned, uh, was created in, in 2008 by Randy Rosenberg, who was a, a curator uh, working on uh, creating traveling museum exhibitions that were content driven. Uh, and that relates to the mission of the organization, which is basically to create art exhibitions and storytelling projects that address critical social and environmental issues in ways that activate people to, to take ownership and, and ultimately change. Uh, I joined the organization in, in 2014. 
Uh, I'm an experimenter by nature. Um, I'm an artist, uh, I'm a curator, but today uh, I, I'm basically a full-time climate activist. And, and one thing I love about uh, uh, curating uh, projects with Artworks for Change is that uh, you get to bring your own stories to the artwork and to use the artwork to uh, tell narratives uh, and, and inspire action and use the unique lens of contemporary art to get people to think about complex issues in, in new ways. Uh, and the Footing the Bill uh, exhibition, Footing the Bill Art and Our Ecological Footprint was, was just uh, one of these experiments where we were looking at uh, our organization's uh, presence in the world. We, we had millions of visitors uh, visiting our traveling museum exhibitions, but our museum exhibitions were not reaching uh, everyone because uh, it really depended on which museums um, took on the shows and, and installed them. People needed the means to pay for a museum ticket. And so part of our goal with, with the Footing the Bill project was to launch a virtual museum environment, uh, much in the way that, that Jason reimagined the ocean floor as a museum environment. We want to, to view the internet as, as a museum environment and to figure out uh, how we could harness some of the special aspects of, of the internet experience to create a, a museum experience, something that would be memorable and intimate uh, and, and lead people to, to new forms of discovery. Um, so the first thing we did was uh, we incorporated a deep zoom feature. Uh, the reasoning here was, you know, if you go to a museum and you try to get your face up to a painting, you're going to quickly be ushered away. But, uh, but in cyberspace with a deep zoom feature, you can see a little lionfish to the left of the whale's tail here. Uh, and we can get with the deep zoom feature to a point where you can see the brush strokes in this amazing painting by Alexis Rockman. So, so that was just kind of a low hanging fruit was to, to use uh, a digital technology to allow people to explore the intimate details. And we also use that tool to, um, to create other perspectives on an artwork so that if someone clicks in the ex exhibit on an artwork, they might see a close up or they might see uh, additional perspectives on it. Uh, we, we use this feature extensively in Jason's gallery because as he mentioned, depending on the time of day or the state of uh, regeneration of the coral, uh, the, the works have, have a life to them, a life uh, that's defined by time and space. Um, we also uh, wanted to uh, use blog style content uh, using the artworks as a springboard for storytelling. Um, as I mentioned before, Many artworks, uh, if you speak to artists, they'll, they'll say that they're an invitation for you to bring your own story. And what, what we did with this, uh, with this gallery is that we brought our own stories and used the, the artworks as, as a springboard for storytelling that would engage people. Uh, and so we had a variety of different channels of content. Uh, uh, throughout the galleries, there was uh, content that we labeled Delve. That's where you could learn more about the artist uh, or that particular artwork. Uh, you know, maybe some of the techniques that the artist used to uh, uh, create artworks that could, could uh, withstand a marine environment. We also had a learn icon where we could uh, bring in content that, that was related to science or, or other technical disciplines. Uh, and an interpret icon where we could put on our curatorial hat and, and interpret the artwork uh, and, and maybe uh, expose some nuances that people might not otherwise uh, re uh, experience. Uh, the reflect icon we used for content where, where we put questions back to the audience, uh, asking them how they interpreted the artwork and, and, and what, what it means to them in the context of the broader environmental issues. And then finally, the, the act icon, which, which uh, highlighted and connected people to calls to action that were inspired by the artwork and the environmental themes that were addressed in the artwork. Uh, so here you can see uh, an example of um, uh, the learn icon. Uh, this, this work, uh, Inheritance by Jason, um, depicts a child looking at a trash pile on the ocean floor. Um, and then the, the content that we paired with it uh, is, is scientific information about the decomposition rates for different types of consumer waste products 
whether it's in the ocean or in landfills. So it's an invitation to, for people to learn more about the issues that are raised in the artwork. Similarly, uh, we connected to each artwork in the exhibition, a call to action that people could share on social media. Um, so in, in this case with inheritance, uh, we linked a series of pledges. You can see one of those pledges here, uh, a pledge to reduce uh, the use of disposable plastic bags and containers. Single use plastics are uh, the, the biggest driver of plastic pollution in our oceans. And that was the issue that Jason was highlighting among others in this work. And so we wanted to empower people who are experiencing the exhibition to think about what they could do uh, maybe share their intention with their social network. And we also built out a series of environmental uh, guides uh, in, in, a, in a feature called our Pledge Center. The other key feature of this exhibition is that we partnered with environmental organizations, uh, some of the world's leading organizations to um, allow them to use the artwork as well to tell the story about the work that they're doing to address these critical issues. Uh, the, the central theme of this exhibition uh, is, is our ecological footprint. And if you look at our ecological footprint, uh, in essence, what, what we're looking at is uh, what is the relationship between what we demand from nature in terms of renewable uh, products and services versus what can nature supply? Um, and it shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone that we are in overshoot. Uh, on a worldwide basis, we are using 1.75 Earth's worth of resources, which means that our legacy for our for future generations is, is that of a, of a great deficit. Uh, we're, we're over harvesting our forests. We are relying excessively on uh, forests and, and soils and oceans to sequester our, our emissions of greenhouse gases. We're, we're making uh, choices with our crop lands and our pastures that that are not sustainable. Uh, we are excessively building up uh, uh, suburban development and urban sprawl uh, to a point where we're crowding out uh, other species and we are overfishing our fish. And that's the that bottom line uh, is that uh, when we think about ecological footprint, we quickly transition into the conclusion that we have uh, ecological overshoot. So what, what is causing ecological overshoot? Uh, at, here you see a work by Antonio Brasenio uh, depicting a symbiotic relationship of indigenous peoples uh, with, with uh, the land. Uh, so we, are, we have gone from a culture of uh, protecting to a culture of extracting. Here we see a work by, by Jason entitled Deregulated, where we have given free reign to private property owners and extractors and corporations to extract without bearing the full cost of, uh, of the activities that they are undertaking. Uh, when, when we extract fossil fuels, we, we are not factoring in the, the negative costs to future generations and the, and the current pollution and the climate crisis. We're simply looking at uh, the limited costs to that a corporation to extract the fuel. And then when we purchase it at the pump to fill our cars, we are not factoring in uh, the billions of dollars, the trillions of dollars of damage from, from hurricanes and rising seas and, and losses of biodiversity and the productivity of our agricultural lands. Uh, sorry, I seem to be frozen. Here's a poetic piece by uh, Juliette Dumont, uh, A Brief History of Oil and Ice. It's a very simple conceptual artwork where she encased oil and ice, and then as it melted, she photographed it, uh, kind of representing the tears and the connection between uh, our consumption of fossil fuels and what's happening to the broader ecosystem. Here we see a, a work by, by the painter Chester Arnold, uh, again, highlighting our, our extractive economies and the wastelands that they leave behind. Here we see the wastewater. This beautiful uh, composition is actually a large scale snow drawing uh, by 
Sonia Henriksen, artist who uh, leads teams of people into uh, vast field snow fields. Uh, this particular artwork uh, is, is tracing the, um, the original uh, uh, flow uh, in an abstracted sense of a tributary of the Colorado River, highlighting how much we've disrupted the natural historical flows of water to divert for, uh, for agriculture and, and other uses. Here we see a beautiful image by the photographer Ed Brutinsky, an aerial view of pivot irrigation related to, to the last land artwork that we just saw, where water is being diverted uh, for, for agricultural use, but that use is, is not particularly sustainable over long periods of time. This is uh, another artwork uh, by an artist, uh, Chris Drury. Um, here, this, this was a, a dry lake bed uh, that, that uh, it, in, in the past had been uh, a place where the Paiute uh, indigenous uh, peoples had, uh, had been hunting and fishing and living in a sustainable way with the landscape. Uh, Chris Drury used a, a rake to create uh, a pattern that is, uh, evokes the, the designs of, of Native American uh, art and symbols. Uh, and so here, um, uh, in contrast to Jason's work where water is a, a defining feature uh, of, of his artwork and, and the environments in which you experience it, here it's, it's the absence of water that, that is telling part of the story. Uh, again, getting back to extraction, this is one of one of my artworks. Um, uh, I, I do have a bit of gallows humor at times in, in my artwork. Uh, here, uh, fighting over the last piece of sushi is just a reference to how much we are overtaxing our fisheries. Uh, and I think you can hear from, from uh, Jason's uh, talk that that's even happening in, in underwater museums these days, that uh, the the, the overfishing and the overtaxing of our ocean's resources uh, is, is uh, threatening our ability to support uh, billions of people who rely on our oceans for, for sustenance. Um, and so one of the challenges of this presentation was, was trying to identify interesting connections between water and, and ecological overshoot. And uh, I think uh, in relation to, uh, to Jason's work, um, you know, as a curator, uh, it, it always helps when when the starting point for for work is that it's it's visually spectacular, and I think there's there's no question about that. But there's a, a lot more depth to it. Um, it's it's aligned with our mission in that it's content driven work. Um, I, I I lived for many years in in downtown Manhattan, and and so I appreciate the street art sensibility of his work, the way that. You are encountering his art in an untraditional context for art. Uh, the, the humor in it, the element of surprise, is very rich in metaphors and references. Uh, I love that it's a, an extension of, of environmental or land art into a new context of a marine environment. And, and as a fellow artist, I, I really appreciate the extraordinary challenges and execution that he, he went through to uh, come up with the materials and, and the installation challenges and, and making it all work. Uh, but, but by far the two, mo my two favorite uh, elements of his work are, uh, are the participatory nature of it. Um, it's participatory for divers, but ultimately it's a collaboration with nature. Uh, and, and it's not just a participatory set of artworks, they're regenerative solving problems, they're protecting existing ecosystems of, of coral and sea life, and they're generating new, new habitats. And I think that's what, what is wonderful about his work, and, and it, it's what combines uh, you know, cautionary messages with hopeful ones. I think that's a key ingredient of successful activism, uh, as Jason alluded to. Um, but when I was uh, curating this exhibition, the reality was many of the artworks I was encountering uh, and my headspace at the time was focused on ecological overshoot. And unfortunately, ecological overshoot comes with uh, an unpleasant dose of reality. Uh, and that dose of reality relates in many ways to water. Uh, so water pollution is a theme in Jason's work and it's also a theme in many of the works in the exhibition. Here you see uh, uh, a, a painting of the Gowanus Canal by 
uh, Alexis Rockman. Uh, Alexis Rockman is a very interesting painter. He, uh, his mother worked at the uh, Museum of Natural History in New York, uh, and he was influenced by, um, by the Hudson River School of Painting. And the result of, of that uh, interesting combination of influences are, are uh, uh, dramatic paintings like this that, that combine natural scenes that have been uh, spoiled by, by pollution. Uh, here's another work by Ed Bertinsky, uh, just a beautiful and, and deeply troubling image of, uh, of wastewater from uh, processing of nickel. Here's a, a, an aerial photograph of the uh, Deep Horizon oil spill by Daniel Beltra. This is a, a, um, a depiction of uh, an infamous incident in, in New York history where uh, a town in New York um, ran out of space in its landfill. So they decided to load up the barge and export their trash to some willing uh, recipient. Um, and uh, not surprisingly, uh, no one was willing to take this barge of trash. So it, it floated around uh, a dramatic journey and then wound up right back where it started. Uh, but the reality of, of this approach to uh, waste management is that much of, uh, far too much of this uh, type of waste, which is not uh, uh, biodegradable, winds up in our, uh, in our waterways. This is a, a, a humorous uh, shadow work by uh, Tim Noble and Sue Webster um, called Dirty White Trash with Gulls, where they, they basically take all of their consumer waste and they pile it up and, uh, and then project uh, a self-portrait um, of their shadows. And here again, as I mentioned before, uh, it, uh, Ocean pollution is, is a key theme that permeates Jason's work uh, and, and permeates the, the exhibit as a whole. Um, but uh, ocean pollution is not limited, unfortunately, to consumer waste. Uh, this is a, a, a beautiful um, visual and audio composition by Coral Mor Morphologic and Animal Collective that we just added this year to the tour uh, uh, by NRDC. Uh, and, and here we see coral that are threatened by um, ocean acidification. So when we are dumping uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, uh, we have to be honest about what we're doing. We are polluting the, the atmosphere and we are also polluting the ocean, which absorbs uh, the carbon dioxide. The, the mixture of the carbon dioxide with the water leads to the acidification, which then negatively impacts coral, the coral and other sea ability to generate uh, a skeletal um, uh, body structure. Uh, and the consequence of this is not limited to our, our fellow species. Here you see gyre by Fred Tomaselli, which is this dramatic um, vision of a, of a fish regurgitating all of these plastics. Uh, if you uh, do a Google search for how much plastic you can find in the fish that we eat, you will find it is a large amount. So we are ingesting massive amounts of plastic. Uh, and this project called Flint Water by uh, William Pope L uh, was, uh, was his uh, way of drawing attention to the, the Flint water crisis. Uh, the water in, in Flint, Michigan uh, had uh, dangerous toxic metals and, and so Pope L decided to bottle this water and sell it as an art object. So that was a, a, a very dramatic uh, project. Uh, the next um, connection that, that I'm identifying between uh, overshoot and water is its impact on, dr on drought and, and hydrology more generally. Uh, and so most of these impacts are gonna be generated from climate change. So here you see dry season by Mary Mattingly. Um, drought is, is something that uh, as, a per, uh, as someone who lives in Northern California, I deal with on a daily basis. Uh, and, and I can say uh, the last several years has been just much worse. And, and so unfortunately in, in areas of the world where there's much less uh, water security uh, and, and access to fresh clean water, this is, is going to be a, a burgeoning crisis. Um, here we see uh, a work, uh, a land artwork by uh, Chris Drury called Carbon Sink. Uh, 
uh, was uh, installed on the University of Wyoming campus. Uh, and then within a short period of time, shut down by uh, the board of directors uh, after the influence of the local coal industry. Uh, so here we have an example of uh, a, a, a land artwork becoming a, a performance artwork where, <laughs> where corporate interests come in and, uh, and eliminate the messaging uh, where Chris Drury was connecting uh, the coal that's being extracted for en energy uh, to the death of the pine forests. Climate change uh, uh, increases the prevalence of drought, changes the hydrology, weakening the defenses of the pine forests, the pine beetles. And so all of these trees that you see here uh, died from pine beetle infestations. Um, here's a, a, an aerial photograph of the Amazon by Daniel Beltra. Uh, and, and here uh, the, the highlight is not what you see, but what you might see in the future. As we change the hydrology of the Amazon and, and uh, continue to over harvest uh, and shrink uh, and impact the, uh, uh, the, the forest's boundaries, um, we may reach a tipping point where, where all of this beautiful rainforest or a meaningful portion of it will become a grassland. Um, and we'll talk about tipping points a little bit more. Uh, this is a, a beautiful sculptural installation by uh, Tsai Guo Kong. Uh, a Chinese artist called uh, Heritage, um, again, highlighting the precious nature of water and its, its critical nature in, in supporting uh, biodiversity. The third uh, a key impact and connection of, of water with, with ecological overshoot is, is melting ice and rising seas. Uh, Sebastian Copeland is a, is a, a photographer and a polar explorer. On the left, you see icebergs that represent land ice uh, uh, being removed from, from land ice formations. And on the right, you see the formation of sea ice. Uh, all of this ice reflects uh, uh, light uh, back into the atmosphere. And as this ice melts and disappears, more heat is absorbed into the ocean. Uh, and all of this ice melting generates uh, rising sea levels. And here you see uh, in this painting entitled Manifest Destiny by Alexis Rockman is a vision of the brook waterfront uh, uh, 200 years in the future. So uh, he has projected forward sea level rise and you can see uh, the coastlines uh, uh, submerged and, and new life regenerating uh, in its place. Here you see uh, uh, an artwork by uh, Mary Manningly entitled Floating a Boulder, which uh, highlights uh, another impact of, of rising sea levels and, and uh, unpredictable flooding, which is uh, just a new wave of, of refugees uh, that, that are uh, driven by the climate crisis. Um, related to that is, is storm intensification. Here you see uh, a painting by Jay Yoshimoto called In a New York Minute. Um, the uh, storms, especially hurricanes and monsoons, uh, as, as ocean temperatures rise, they, they feed the intensity of storms, um, the higher wind speeds, greater uh, concentration of rain in, in uh, dropping from those storms. And we've seen that in the news almost daily. Uh, this beautiful work by Lori Nix and Kathleen Gerber called Control Room, uh, these artists build elaborate dioramas that are typically table-sized, uh, and then they create photographs of those dioramas as the final uh, manifestation of, of the artwork. But here, the, the concept of control room, it has a post-apocalyptic feel and the reference to uh, the references to humanity's assumption that we'll be able to turn climate change on and off at will, uh, when in fact, uh, the forces uh, with between feedback loops and tipping points um, might catch us somewhat more flat-footed. Uh, final impact that I'm highlighting today is, is a loss of habitat and, and biodiversity. Uh, and this photograph by uh, Chris Jordan, uh, this is an unaltered photograph uh, in, in the uh, Mid Mid Midway Island of uh, a baby albatross's um, uh, stomach contents. All of this plastic debris that's, that's floating around in the ocean is uh, uh, mistaken for, uh, for food, jellyfish, and things like that. Uh, and, and unfortunately, 
that has no nutritional value and cannot be digested at leading to the death of, of some of those birds. Um, I was glad that I included this slide because uh, uh, Helen spoke uh, glowingly of sharks and uh, Laura Ball is a wonderful painter whose work uh, incorporates uh, the interwoven web of life into every uh, uh, presentation of, uh, of creatures. And it's that web of life that's very fragile. So as we threaten species like coral, we are threatening, threatening entire webs of life. This uh, uh, image of an Everglades ecosystem by Daniel Kukla, uh, is, he does photographs of zoos. Uh, and so, uh, but, but this is, becomes a representation of the types of stranded habitats that we are likely to experience as climate change uh, erodes biodiversity. So in the Everglades in particular, um, as, as uh, the salt water continues to rise, mangrove forests uh, become overrun, uh, 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 ecosystems wind up disappearing, and these little islands of biodiversity uh, uh, face greater and greater risks of survival. Um, the final connection I'd like to highlight is, is regeneration. And I think Jason mentioned it earlier. Uh, and I think crossing the Rubicon is, is a great uh, a great sculptural installation to highlight this, right? Because it combines the potential of humanity to regenerate through innovation, through technology, through a symbiotic relationship with nature, while also highlighting that, that we are in fact uh, on a precipice. We are at a threshold where, where the tipping points are real. Um, and, and so it, it's going to take uh, a dramatic uh, shift in, in how we approach um, our, our, env our environmental behaviors, uh, as well as our, our extractive economies uh, in order for us to uh, change direction here and provide uh, you know, a, a bright future for future generations. And I think uh, uh, Vicissitudes is another wonderful sculpture that, that you know, reminds us of what's, what's at stake. We have uh, uh, what's at stake and what, where the potential lies. Uh, so a lot more of my work these days is working with youth activists to help them find their place in the climate movement and focus on the types of activism that can lead to change at a systems level. Uh, and so this, this particular work uh, speaks to me. And the regenerative nature of, uh, of ecosystems, our ocean environments, uh, of, of our land environments, will be a, a, an ongoing source of hope. Um, and it's a, it's a source of hope that Jason has, has harnessed so beautifully in his works uh, by transforming uh, and connecting to communities in, in ways that lead to the protection and the growth of new coral and, uh, and related uh, bio communities. Uh, and so I wanna um, thank Jason for, uh, for producing the, these bodies of work and for his, uh, for his wonderful um, messaging that, that he brings to, to his art practice. Thank you very much, Al. Thank you for your presentation. Maybe I would just ask you a, one little question. Um, uh, could you tell more about your initiatives, uh, your work with uh, young uh, climate activists? Yes, absolutely. So I think um, for, for young activists, the, the journey from um, concern to effective action is, is one that is, is really difficult. Um, in fact, it's, it's difficult for everyone, but it's, it's particularly difficult for young people. And so what, what we've been doing with, with young activists is we've been moving beyond uh, self-help to help. So a lot of the environmental movement is focused on self-help, where people publish guides and they, uh, they distribute information that, that increases the level of alarm, uh, but then they leave it to people to figure out their own way forward in terms of how to, to make a difference. Uh, and so what we've been doing is we've been curating uh, uh, lists of opportunities that are uh, specific to geographic areas that can help young people that we work with and mentor 
to get involved in the climate movement in impactful ways. And that often leads to a portfolio of climate actions that range from personal household level actions that make us feel empowered and, and make us feel like we have control to local community actions, uh, starting an environmental club at a university, um, uh, advocating for plant-based meals at, uh, at, their, at their university, advocating for renewable energy at the university, uh, and operating in with, with whatever communities they operate in. And finally, operating at scale and, and trying to lobby for uh, national and global policies like carbon taxes uh, and, and subsidies for clean energy innovation uh, and regulation and, and bans on certain extractive activities that, that can help us uh, make big impacts and not just small impacts. Because I think the sooner we can accelerate people's attention to, uh, to these solutions at scale, the sooner that our governments will act in the ways that they need to in order to uh, address the issues at scale. Because climate change is too big for us to solve one light bulb at a time. We're just not going to do it. We need to drive fossil fuel use out of our global economy and quickly. And there are policies that can do that, but they need to be embraced. Uh, and so far, um, governments have relied more on creative accounting um, and verbiage than they have on, on real policies that can drive uh, uh, fossil fuel use out. Thank you. Okay, that was wonderful. Thank you very much. I am aware of the time. Um, but we did promise a round table, so we are gonna open up to questions. But while, um, but before that, I would still like to um, also give the opportunity for our guests to talk to each other. Unfortunately, Helen has had to run and catch a train, so she won't be taking part of this, but she does invite all of you to um, ask her these, your questions directly via Twitter. I just put it in the chat. Um, so, so really quickly, if, if it's okay with my colleagues, I, I just wanna start um, with the first question for both uh, Jason and Al, um, because the, 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 the topic of this particular session is underwater. I would like to talk um, about, about the medium um, a bit more and how that, that, that connects both of your, your, your talks and your work. Um, it's obviously endlessly fascinating, um, Jason, to, to to even start to imagine the multiple ways in which um, that particular uh, um, situation of immersion affects uh, the experience of your work and the works themselves. And I'm wondering um, to what extent you see water as a co-creator um, with you. It seems you, you speak about a thousand different shades of blue and the ways in which sometimes there are more fish than sculptures and how you're anticipating and even um, um, accommodating the eventuality of your works changing that environment. But then I'm also wondering when um, the experience of your work, when it's not happening through social media, but actually um, through immersion, what senses you are intentionally um, um, highlighting. So we lose the, usually immersion is considered a multi-sensational experience, but we're losing sound and breath um, to, uh, what, uh, to what's precise artistic goal. And then Al in the same sense, I'm wondering if you see yourself as kind of a water avatar um, through the digital platform as being the tool that sort of submerges us into an experience of the work and allows also multi-sensorial experience with scientific data, et cetera, also being part of the artistic experience. So whoever wants to go first. <laughs> um, I can certainly address the, the, the experience of, of being underwater. Um, so obviously a lot of people see my work um, digitally, but you know, I, I certainly encourage most people to to, to visit, visit it and, and, and go into the sea, get underwater and, and see what's going on. And um, it's, it's only there. I think that, you know, that's the sort of the essence of it is, is the works are, are never static. You know, they're, they're constantly changing. I can go to the same piece every day and it will be completely different. Um, and that's a multiple, multiple factors. You know, the, the, um, the water visibility makes a big, big difference. And it's very, very changeable. 
Um, so, and that really, it really sort of changes that interaction, how much you can understand of the work, whether you just get to see a fragment of it or whether the full installation is revealed. Um, the hues, the colors, um, also just the, the fact that you're suspended in, in, a, in a liquid, in, in, in water. I think it, it, it divorces yourself from, from reality. It divorces yourself from being judged in a way. It's not like going into a gallery and think, oh, I have to you know, really uh, analyze this and have a critical opinion about it. It's, it's some, somehow it kind of uh, detaches you from that and you, you're able just to sort of uh, float and, and be in, in the present, be, be connected. And I think uh, water allows you to, to do that. You feel things, you feel things differently. You feel sound rather than hear sound. Um, you, 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 you're just, it's difficult to, to, to describe. And I think, you know, I certainly encourage people to, to really get underwater and, and, and see how spectacular it is. For my part, I, I really like the parallel that you drew between um, the immersive underwater experience and the immersive digital experience. And, and I'd like to you know, draw the metaphor forward a little bit and say, um, you know, like Jason, we were experimenting when we created uh, this, this gallery and this way of experience and an exhibition. And one of the main things we learned uh, is that, you know, like with, with the experience of, uh, of going to the underwater museums, you don't want to dive alone. Um, and so I think one of the things that we've learned from, from this approach to activism is, is that uh, having a curated experience, uh, a chaperoned experience where someone will walk through and point out all these highlights will enrich the experience that much more and make that immersive experience more impactful. Uh, I think we succeeded in being able to uh, engage people and keep them there for longer than the typical um, uh, internet flyby. Um, but ultimately, the experience of, of having someone shepherd you through, uh, through that deep dive into these issues uh, and then bring you out the other side and say, you know, I know that was a lot to, uh, to, to take in, but, but there's, there's things that we can do. And, and the journey starts here. It doesn't, it doesn't end here. Um, for me, that, that's been the powerful lesson learned. And that's why a lot of our storytelling projects uh, that, that are active now are, are much more focused on, uh, on shepherding people and chaperoning people through that experience of getting involved in the climate movement, starting small, uh, doing things that are, that are easier bite-sized things that still have an impact and then graduating to uh, you know, leading your environmental club and, and speaking out at your local city council meeting about uh, a climate action plan or, or things of that nature. So there's a real journey here and, and it's one that shouldn't be taken alone. Okay, so um, how to proceed? Kamala, do you have any trace of um, which uh, questions were first or would people just like to raise their hand, use the little raise your hand uh, icon and then you can um, read out your, last, your question? Um, yes, there were, there were uh, several questions about the um, uh, production conditions, um, uh, both for Jason and for Al. How do you work with galleries? How do galleries commission your works? How do you get the permission to, uh, to, to install it actually in this difficult environment? So um, would, it, would you, uh, Johannes Birger, would you, uh, would you ask your question? I guess you had several questions, actually. Wow, I'm I'm still overwhelmed, and I want to thank thank you all. And the last two speakers, also Helen's uh, books, are fascinating. But Jason, your work threw me off because I did not imagine it was possible to work on such scale uh, in the ocean. And so my my question is a political one: how, how can you do this? First of all, financially, I know that Crystal who works not underwater, but over water, uh, finances in the millions, you know, his, um, his um, coverings. And currently I think he did the Arc de Triomphe. I, I then wondered who actually controls ocean under, underground spaces? Are these government regions? Um, 
country territories. So who can commission you to do a piece in the Mediterranean or in the Indian Pacific? And then thirdly, uh, maybe this also is something that I hear from Al, there is an activist dimension and the climate consciousness that I totally appreciate. But uh, you are putting a lot of stuff down there, right? And for the moment, I feel the aesthetics for me distracts from the actual activist fight. And also who can, who, someone else asked this question, who has access to see your museum? Sorry, just, you know, I, it's I okay. to, yeah. Um, first of all, sure, to, to realize all the projects is extremely complicated and takes a long time. Um, some of the, uh, some most projects take sort of three, three years, five years to actually um, get established. There, there's a hell of a lot of politics involved, uh, fundraising, permitting, uh, the, the, yes, it's, it's, they're all very complicated um, and take a long time to, to, to establish. And there's lots of surveys in working out, um, you know, which is the right site, whether the artwork's appropriate at all, um, whether <laughs> it has the right objective, it, it's certainly a, a long process. Generally, most of my work is commissioned by governments um, oh. and so governments actually uh, have the jurisdiction or they work with um, with institutes or or government bodies that, that have control over those areas. Um, could, you that, argue, could you argue for a latent comments, this common space that I mentioned in my question, is there such a consciousness in governments that water could be free for art? Um, no, no, it, it's, it's very territorial. There's, there's certainly uh, every area is is demarked in a, in a certain way, um, and that was and that was I sort of have tried to sort of play with a little bit in my in installations, as how we how we've carved up our landscapes with with arbitrary lines and and borders and fronteras um, underwater. That's nonsense because it's such a, a fluid environment. Everything in marine life migrates all around. Everything is connected, and so it, it doesn't make sense in um, in a, in a in a way we worked before managing, you know, our different countries. Um, so certainly, but it's also when you talk about scale, it's it's a little bit hard to comprehend how vast it is underwater. You know, you look at look at our, our blue planet from one side, and and there's very very little landmass. Um, it's it's endless, and and very little of the sea sea substrate is hard enough for or stable enough for marine organisms to actually be attached to. Um, and I've done calculations with some marine parks. And even when I worked in Mexico, where we made, you know, made a thousand sculptures, um, it was inside a marine park, which was, you know, a very, very small fraction of the coastline. Um, and I used up maybe 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. 0.1% of the sea floor. Um, and when I built it on land, it was huge. It was a vast kind of installation. It took over the, the car park. It took over my studio. It was, it was really monumental. And I put it in the sea and it was just this tiny little speck of, <laughs> of artwork that all the fish sort of uh, shrugged their shoulders at. Um, so yes, I mean, and that's one of the reasons why I do have to, I do have to upscale everything. And um, sometimes it's quite daunting and, and it's also quite a lot of hard work. Um, if I might respond to um, to your comment, I, I think it was a uh, it's an important one to talk about, right? Uh, and I completely appreciate the sentiment that we don't have time for art given everything we need to do to address the climate crisis. Uh, but what we take for granted, uh, perhaps, is that others are in the similar mindset that that other people are in emergency mode. Um, you and I are in emergency mode, but as soon as you leave your house and you look around uh, at the people in the community, much fewer of those people are in emergency mode. And so the question is, what percentage of their attention span can you get to talk to them about uh, becoming part of the climate movement or even realizing that there's a climate crisis? And that's where, as an activist who's done a lot of grassroots engagement, uh, I see the power of art and storytelling. So I'm gonna put a link in the chat. This is a video game that, that we created recently. Uh, and the premise of this video game is uh, to 
uh, inform people through a familiar video game uh, about the, the nature of our relationship to fossil fuels and what are, what are our ways out of the climate crisis through, through policy action. So um, my question to you is if, if you were uh, talking to people in your social network about uh, a climate tax with a rebate to households as a key part of the policy portfolio to solve the climate crisis, how many words would you get out before they walked out of the room? <laughs> because with this video game, I can get 20 minutes of someone's attention because there's so many nuances built into this video game. It's basically a conceptual artwork that I can talk about for 20 minutes with people who are interested in it because it's connected to me in a personal way. It's, it's interesting, it's intellectual, but all the while they're hearing about how our relationship to fossil fuels is like the forbidden fruit and that we are operating in a constrained system and that as we consume more and more fossil fuels, the tail of the snake gets longer and longer and it's harder to navigate without dying. And that's the nature of the climate crisis, but there are solutions that can help solve that. So already they've listened to me for a far longer period of time than they would otherwise have. And so art and storytelling actually play a, a crucial role and the failing of many environmental organizations and activists is tied to uh, a, a lack of creativity in their approach to climate communication uh, as a fundamental thing. Because people have been saying, people who are concerned and alarmed and backed with facts have been saying the same thing for decades. Uh, and it doesn't matter how many different ways they say it using direct terms and data they're not getting through to uh, the vast majority of people because there are psychological barriers. And so the art and storytelling can play a critical role in, in getting through, uh, through those, um, those, those barriers. Um, there was some uh, critique and a couple of questions from uh, Ray Langenbach. Are you here with us, Mr. Longenbach? Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, uh, thank you, uh, first of all, to all the speakers. Uh, yeah, and thank you all for your commitment also. I mean, it, which is remarkable and, 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 you know, really needed and wonderful. Um, the, uh, um, for um, Jason, uh, the, the one question was, you know, an, uh, terrestrial, um, antecedent. Uh, are you familiar with Gustav Bigeland and the, the Bigeland Park in, in Oslo? Because the, the relationship to your work is quite uncanny, um, particularly in the, the uh, ensembles. Yes, definitely. Yeah, I'm a big fan okay. of his work. Um, I've spent quite a bit of time in Oslo and been to the Bigeland Park and seen his foundation. And yeah, no, no, huge right. fan of his work. And I appreciate this kind of the scale that he works on is, you know, uh, how he's, you know, he, you know, in a way, you know, I have a lot of respect because he he carves granite, you know, which, which is yeah. a, a lifetime's uh, uh, yeah. dedication. So yeah, no, I'm, I'm uh, yeah, he, yeah, um, uh, yeah, and, and that brings up another another issue, you know, the um, uh, that of the materiality or the materials that you're using, and uh, I mean, my latest question is, is there a material which Deacidifies the ocean rather than being pH neutral, which you talked about, uh, will actually move in the opposite direction, which is something that that um, uh, yeah. So uh, uh, possibly that's a good idea. I'm, I'm I'm not aware of anything at the moment, and okay. I think again, just for scalability, you know, the, <laughs> um, there really are specks of sand that that that, that I'm putting in the ocean, so. Any all of those kind of ocean ocean sort of um, interactions, I think it's like when we talk about using the ocean as carbon sink and and ha yeah. having huge uh, um, uh, plankton farms. So you know, I, I, when you when you in practice, it, it's incredibly difficult. Yeah, and, and one more, and then I'll, then I'll be quiet. Uh, the um, the the issue of shapes and forms, and and what are the most ideal forms for the regeneration aspect 
um, you know, uh, you're, you're using human bodies, you know, and there's something a little bit disturbing about seeing the anthropoids, you know, advancing the, Im our image into the, uh, um, the oceans. Um, but, uh, so that's an aesthetic issue, but, but, but the, um, the issue of, of what is the ideal form, you know, for the regeneration. So, you know, I was very happy to see the lobster beetle, you know, which, which actually seemed to be designed for a particular species. Now th that, you know, that question, you know, of what are the, what are the ideal forms for your sculptures? You know, are, is it humans or is it something else which would regenerate better and, and allow coral to grow faster? Uh, th that's the question. Yeah. And that's yes, my last I mean, definitely the, each ecosystem has different inhabitants that they require different uh, habitats. So, uh, Yes, there's, there's certainly you can certainly tailor it to each um, ecosystem, ecosystem. And there's you know the more holes, the the more uh, hiding space, the rougher the textures, the the different elevations in in the the water column. There's a whole each place has you know a whole sort of uh, spectrum of changes that you could make. Um, and I could certainly maybe focus more just harboring marine life. Um, but that's also, I think the, the habitat creation is just one of its aspects. And, and the reason I use human figures a lot um, is because it's a, a very sort of uh, international language that I can tell, uh, tell a message sort of globally that people, unfortunately, <laughs> I think we're incredibly narcissistic. We, we all, um, you know, relate to something when we, when we see ourselves in it. And, uh, and, Part of it is, as the, all these works get abstracted very quickly underwater, they get lots and lots of growth and they completely change. Um, but when they're colonized, there's, if there's just an element that we can recognize as human, I think we develop a sense of, of empathy. Um, and, and I think that's really important when, when you know, talking about the underwater world. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank mm -hmm. you.